Joining us on the summit today is internal medicine physician, Dr. Sharon Goldberg. Sharon, welcome to the summit. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for being here, for spending this time with us. Uh, people uh, may already know you. Those are the familiar with 5G and the, and the conversation from your testimony at the, um, the Michigan House Energy Committee hearings on 5G. Uh, in late 2018. And so I'm really looking forward to this conversation because with your your background and your your ex extensive knowledge and expertise in in medicine in electromagnetic radiation, we're going to give some a really powerful set of grounded facts and perspectives today in this conversation. So really looking forward to dive in. And I'm just going to share with our audience a little bit about your background and then we'll, we'll get started. So Dr. Sharon Goldberg is an integrative internal medicine physician. She is one of a small but growing number of physicians to have completed the Advanced Electromagnetic Radiation coursework with the Building Biology Institute. And by the way, uh, Larry Gust is in, the, is in the summit as well. So we had a great, great. conversation. He's one of my teachers. Him. Excellent. <laughs> and has technical experience with electromagnetic field assessment and remediation. Her background includes 15 years as an academic hospital medicine physician and medical educator responsible for the training of medical students and resident physicians at teaching hospitals in New York City and the University of Miami. She has co-authored publications in the fields of dietary supplementation, autonomic nervous system assessment, and nutritional epidemiology. And Dr. Goldberg is an editorial member of the journal uh, Electromagnetic Biology and Medicine. So very extensive background. Uh, we'll, we'll dive right in. How did you first become aware of the effects from electromagnetic radiation? Well, I was just like everyone else. I didn't think twice about carrying a cell phone in my pocket, on my body, using it all the time. It's about five years ago. And I was working at the University of Miami where my cell phone came from the Department of Medicine. So I was due for a new phone. I wanted an iPhone. I had had a BlackBerry. I brought the new phone home and I had a conference call that I did holding it on speaker like this for 20 minutes. And by the end of the call, my, my finger was burning. It was like, like a neuropathic pain that a diabetic would get in their toes, like a burning pain in my finger. And I thought, wow, this is, this is, this is not okay. <laughs> What's going on? So I started reading that night about, about electromagnetic fields from phones and health effects. And I was really shocked to find out that actually there was a lot of science to show that the conditions that we treated in the hospital and in internal medicine clinics, there's a lot of science to show that the pathophysiology overlaps with the effects of electromagnetic fields. So that was a big shocker for me and an eye opener. And the next morning, of course, I brought my phone back to my administrator and I asked her for a low SAR phone, which, which I got the following week. So, and it turns so out lesser, that a lesser actually, radiation phone. So just SAR specific absorption rate. Exactly. Um, so, exactly. so a phone that, that microwaves less, less power, right? Exactly. Okay. It's, uh, it's the amount of radiation per, per unit weight. So it's, it's a measurement. It's not such a great measurement, but it does measure something. And in, in this case, the phone that I had been given was an iPhone 5, which I was told many years later was actually a high radiation phone. Um, and then I, I switched it to one that, at least on paper, is is less, you know, lower radiation phone. So, so that's what I got interested in. That was five years ago, and but that got me really interested in it because I had been, um, like you mentioned, I had been doing some research and doing a lot of teaching with medical students and residents. And and one of the things that that is a big issue for all physicians is that our patients have just been becoming sicker and sicker with every passing year. Internal medicine used to be essentially geriatrics when I started 20 years ago. Uh, we didn't have young, the young people that were in hospitalized in internal medicine wards all had a reason to be there. They, they weren't just there. And when, when I say a reason to be there, I mean, they would have, they would be dialysis patients. They would have epilepsy. They would have 
uh, autoimmune disorder or some type of acute infection or other issues, but it was everything was kind of clear and we knew why they were there. What's been happening over the past 20 years is that internal medicine patients are becoming younger and younger with more and more comorbid conditions, so like a longer list of diseases that they come in and longer medication lists. So this has been a challenge for, you know, for I think for all physicians, but also for medical educators who deal with medical students, because in my last couple of years at the University of Miami, I saw something that I had never seen, which is medical students would, you know, show up on our ward their first day for, for their clerkships and and they would look at the how sick the patients were and you could just see it in their eyes that they were, they were burnt out already like they were like how you know and how can you teach how can you teach someone to take care of a simple medical problem like abdominal pain in a patient who has a, a history of stroke heart attack cancer you know this long list of problems so that's that's how i got into it what are the uh, what are some of the common misperceptions in in your view of EMFs and EMFs, you know, electromagnetic frequencies, electromagnetic radiation being uh, in interchangeable terms? Yeah, so I think that there are a lot of misperceptions, a lot. But I think that I think that the biggest one, really, I think I'll I'll mention two. The biggest one is that we keep hearing that there's some this this controversy or debate in the scientific literature about whether or not electromagnetic fields, and, and I'll, I guess I'll speak specifically about microwave radiation, because we're talking, this is about 5G and about wireless radiation. So I'm speaking about microwave radiation now. That the misconception is that we, we don't have enough science to make a decision as far as whether or not we need to warn the public and take action to lower exposures. And this is this is completely false. We have, you know, we have such clear evidence that microwave radiation, that it is a what I would call a broad spectrum pathogen. So it causes all sorts of different diseases and a multi-site carcinogen. So it causes cancer in many different parts of the body. Um, and we understand a lot, you know, a whole bunch of basic mechanisms about why this would be. We we understand that. So it's it's completely false from the scientific perspective when you hear, well, we you know we need more research. That you know, the, it's still a debate. That there's there's not anything to debate. So that's that's I think the the biggest the the biggest misperception out there. Um, the other thing that I think people don't understand is we we assume that there are health protective guidelines out there that the everyone cites the FCC guidelines for from for EMF for microwave emissions as being protective of human health. So actually this I mean this couldn't be further from the truth because so first of all these guidelines Develop, you know, they are decades old, and the reason that they were set as high as they are is because they they needed to the when you know when when these excuse me when all of the the conferences the people got together to figure out what where were they going to set the limits. It was a time when the military needed they they needed microwaves for military telecommunications and for radar. It was very important. If you go back and I believe it was in the 60s when they the late 60s when they first when they they first set these levels and and they 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 set them intentionally high to allow for, you know, military uses. And it was important at the time because we believed that you know, the country was under threat for you know, nuclear war and and this was important. So that's where everything started. But then the problem is that, that the guidelines were never revised. And so they're based on this, this false assumption that if, um, if microwaves don't, so we call that the thermal effect, but essentially what that means is if, if the level of radiation, if it's not enough to heat you, it's not enough to harm you. That we know now is completely false. And we actually knew we knew in the 70s that this was false because, and I can show you, I have this, this book called The Biological Effects of Microwaves. 
from 1976. And they actually write in this book that it's not enough to say that, you know, that that microwave exposure, a harm from microwave exposure has to do with thermal effect and nothing else. It's it's not true. They write it in there and that's that's from 1976. So as far as the the health protective guidelines go, these FCC guidelines that that are cited all the time as an assurance of safety. So they're not relevant to the chronic daily exposure that we see in, in our country. They're, they only apply to exposures that are 30 minutes or less. So it's for a short-term exposure. Um, they were developed by, by engineers and mostly people from industry and the military. And physicians and public health, uh, people with public health training weren't consulted. So those are, I think those are the two, those are really the two big misperceptions that are, it's really important to understand that, that there are no guidelines now, that really no one is looking out for, for our health in a regulatory manner. There's no regulation mm -hmm. because the guidelines are simply too high. Mm -hmm. And only based on thermal effects and they don't exactly. even, they don't even look at all of those thousands of studies that are re referenced in that book from the 70s, right? Right. I mean, and that book has, has, oh, and actually I have another, another two things that I was going to show you. Here's another one right here. Okay. So this is, I, I picked these because, well, they're good, but does it show up? Yes. Yeah. So this is from the Naval Medical Research Institute from 1971. Okay. This is a bibliography of, of the effects of microwave radiation that they knew about in 1971. And this is really easy to read. It's essentially, it's a bibliography and it's just sort of a laundry list of all of the, of all of the effects that they were seeing in the seventies from microwave radiation. So, and it looks, it looks like this. Does it show up? Yep. It, it's just a, a, B, C, D. It's a list of, of, of effects. So this is really the bottom line here is if you if you look at the way public health has deteriorated over the past 20 years, and I'm not saying that this proves that microwave radiation is the cause of everything. Obviously, it's not the cause of everything. All I'm saying is that there's very compelling science to show that many, many of the chronic conditions that we see today uh, are linked mechanistically and are linked in, you know, in the older science that is very accessible to anyone. So to just give you an example, we have, we have an epidemic of suicide in the United States now, depression and suicide that's been going on. And we have states that have a 50% increase in their suicide rates. And this is, this is horrible. This is not, you know, this isn't just because times are tough and people are I mean, something organic is going on. So if you look at, you know, if you look at this right here, well, what does it say? There's a whole section on psychological disorders, page nine, section F, human behavioral studies. What do they see? What do they see? Number one, neurasthenia, which they, they explain as general bad feeling. Number two, depression. Number four, anxiety. Uh, number eight, hallucinations. Number 11, increased irritability insomnia, loss of memory. So this is, and this isn't the only source. I mean, so we, we know that, we know that the connections are there. So it's just a matter of blowing the dust off of a lot of the, the older research and connecting it with our, our current health situation. And we really need to do this because we, we can't afford, we can't afford any more sick people. We can't afford to pay for it. We can't, we, we just can't afford it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we mentioned uh, Larry Gust, uh, president of the board of the Building Biology Institute, who we mm -hmm. talked to. So he, for those that want to dive right into solutions, he goes step by step in how to make your home safe, both mm -hmm. from, from sources of, of EMFs in the home and outside of the home and what to do. So highly recommend mm -hmm. that talk for everyone. Also, um, okay, so we talk... Uh, also with um, Dr. Ronald Melnick, who, very compelling conversation. He was the designer of one of these many thousands of studies, but a very prominent study called the National Toxicology Program Study on Cell Phone Radiation. It was originally commissioned in the late 90s by the FDA, 
And when the results were finally published in 2016, then again in 2018, the FDA basically said, we're not doing a risk assessment. We're not going to look at, at the data. We're not going to look at the results. It's not applicable to humans. So what is your take on that? Well, I think that my take, I think that really my most important take is that that I don't see any point in funding in funding research if we're going to just blow off the results when they're inconvenient. But really, so my, which is essentially what happened. And this is from what I understand, and, and maybe this is not 100% correct, but I've asked a couple of you know, senior people who have worked in, in these types of, worked on these types of studies. My, I had a question for them about, well, has this ever been done before? Because national toxicology program studies are really the gold standard of exposure studies for a toxicant in the United States. And when you do a national toxicology program study on, on an agent, if the, if the study shows an association, what ends up happening is that that agent gets labeled and it gets listed on our ATSDR, the Agency for Toxic Substances, I think Disease Registry, it's called ATSDR. Hopefully I'm not messing up what it stands for. And that's what's always happened. And I was, I had asked them, well, is this, is this the first time that this has happened? How is it possible that we can have a, po a, a positive NTP study showing clear association with cancer of the brain and heart and DNA damage and cardiomyopathy, which is a precursor to heart failure? How is it possible that the study is done and then no actions are taken? And I wasn't, I wasn't able to get a good answer, but, but the answer, what, what I understood is that this is a a first that it's that it's the first time that a national toxicology program study has been just disregarded completely so as far as the results being non applicable to humans that's a really so that's a really good question sort of from the research perspective so why don't we just say let's say really what they're implying is that well we need to redo the study and we need to do it on humans. That's what they're saying, right? And this is a really important point about, about microwave radiation and, how, and our ability to research it as of 2000, you know, 2019. Because we have so much basic science and clinical research, and it's so clear that there are harms associated with microwave radiation exposure, it's not possible to do human exposure studies because we know that these exposures are dangerous. In other words, in order to do a, a study on humans, you have to go before an institutional review board with a whole proposal outlining, you know, what is your research plan? And part of that is, well, what does the existing research say about the exposure that you're planning for your study participants. And, and with microwaves, they're gonna look and they're gonna laugh and they're gonna say, well, no way, we can't approve us. It's not ethical to expose a group of people, participants to, uh, to an exposure that we know causes DNA damage, blood brain barrier leakage, cell membrane leakage, calcium channel issue, and on and on and on any one of these these basic effects is a really big deal. That we have a whole laundry list of, of effects that we know are associated with microwave radiation exposure. So to answer your question, it's, it's really misleading to say that the results are not applicable. The study was, the, the only way to study this was with, uh, with laboratory animals. It's not possible to study with humans, so it's it's misleading. That is, that's my long-winded answer. What are your top health concerns about five G? Well, so first of all, the when you look at the science on microwave radiation the, and cell towers in general, the distance from from the antenna really matters as far as medical about clinical endpoints as far as symptoms. So I think my top concern about 5G is that, and this is based on my understanding, you know, as a non-engineer, is that what's happening now is they're putting up these small cells 
And the justification for the small cells is that the millimeter wave technology, which is going to come later, so the, the highest energy microwaves, don't travel very far. So the, the uh, base stations or the small cells have to be placed closer to homes. But my understanding is that what's being placed in these small cells isn't really, it's not the millimeter waves. It's we're using our existing networks and we're bringing them closer to homes. So th this, is, this is very concerning for health effects. So I think that's, that's number one. The, you know, the second thing is that 5G is being rolled out with any kind of pre-market safety testing. And, and we hear from, you know, from the FCC and from the wireless industry that, that they're, well, maybe they haven't used these words, but that they believe that it's safe, that there's no reason, that there's no reason to believe that it's harmful. But when you really look at the, the scientific literature, I'm not sure what they're talking about because we've got plenty of studies of millimeter waves that show, show health effects. They show biological effects. So we know that they, you know, there's a, there's, there are serious concern for eye damage. So we know that millimeter waves are associated with cataracts, with corneal damage. I mean, this is what the science says. Um, so eye damage is a big one. Um, my, the other concerns are immune system effects because the science shows effects on the immune system, effects on, on endogenous opioids, so nervous system effects, potentially mood effects, likely mood effects. And really the biggest one in my mind, well, it's hard to rank them, but is what about the effects on bacteria? Because we know that millimeter waves have been have been shown to cause antibiotic resistance in Staphylococcus and E. coli, and so I mean think about it. All of the you know the the superbug MRSA infections that's Staph, um, the E. coli infections that you see. I mean, and this is not. It, it actually kind of makes sense if you think about it, just from the science perspective, because the general effect of electromagnetic fields on living cells and living systems is that when you expose them over time, it's, uh, it's a, it, it induces a stress response. So with toxin-forming bacteria, when, if they're put under stress for periods of time, what do they do? They, they form toxin because that's how they, that's how they defend themselves. So that, that kind of makes, is, is biologically plausible and so th those are my, those are my concerns really that that we have we have good scientific evidence to say that millimeter wave technology is harmful and that we know that the existing networks we already know that the existing networks are harmful so we shouldn't be bringing them closer to our houses that just doesn't make sense so those are those are the main ones and then of course it's it will lead to 24/7 mandatory radiation of the entire population. So for instance, pregnant women, children, people with chronic conditions, elderly, we know that they're at, at higher risk for having adverse effects. So there's no informed consent and there's no way for them to opt out of the exposure. Mm -hmm. um, in the summit, Dr. Deborah Davis actually goes through and names some of the specific studies and their conclusions, studies that have been done about specifically millimeter wave radiation, independent studies. And also, Sayer G talks about a briefing, he shares a briefing that he received detailing some pretty startling facts about 5G, about the satellite component of 5G and the plan, which has been verified, it's fact now, it's not just some idea, but it's fact that the plan, um, according to the FCC and these corporations, is, is for approximately 20,000 satellites to be launched by the end of 2020, uh, Amazon, OneWeb, and SpaceX being three of the leading companies, and 5 million Five million uh, watts, I believe, was the approval for each one of these. And what do you want to touch on that? The satellite uh, component of five G and how significant of a, of, a, of a threat is is that even just by itself? Well, I just think 
I think that the whole concept, I think what it all comes down to is, is that if you can't expose humans to microwaves in a lab, in a, in a controlled environment, if you can't even do that ethically, because we have so much evidence of harm, none of these technologies should be getting rolled out. This is illegal. There are all sorts of laws that, that are supposed to protect us from being experimented on, but this is exactly, this is, this is human experimentation. It's not some type of, this is experimenting with the planet. It's experimenting with, with human health, with the health of our, our insects, our birds. It's, it's just unconscionable. What do you say to the FCC and industry claims that there is no proof of harm from 5G or, or microwave or millimeter wave radiation? Well, I think that they need to read the literature. That's, mm -hmm. what, that's what I have to say. And, and it would be pretty easy, I'm sure, for a lot of the, the people that you're, you're interviewing for this summit, you know, if we had an hour or two to sit down with these people, I mean, but I'm sure they don't need to hear it from us. There, the studies are out there. It's not, this isn't some type of, um, this, the studies are out there. They're, they're accessible to people who want to access them. And yes, EMF science is, it requires a bit of, just a bit of training to understand, to interpret studies, but it's not rocket science. It's not. And it's, it isn't, this is this is pretty black and white stuff. It's not. This isn't something that's really open to er interpretation. We know that DNA damage is a really bad finding. It, it's not. We don't want DNA damage. We don't want our cell membranes to leak. We don't want. You know, all of these things that we see. You know, we don't want corneal damage, immune system. We. The bottom line is that microwaves inter. They interfere with normal housekeeping functions of the body. And I mean, that's, that's really just sort of the ultimate take home message. And when you microwave a population of people, they get sick because the body isn't able to just do its thing. All of these different mechanisms, these different, our, our physiology has to be able to, to remain intact. And it's not, that, that's, the, that's really the, the bottom line. So the satellites just, I, it, it, I don't understand how it's happening, but it, it's very, it's pretty scary. Yeah. You mentioned uh, millimeter waves uh, radiation, the, the, the science that links to eye damage, to corneal damage, and um, also skin damage. But the, the industry is claiming, that, and that that's an, should be enough right there, obviously, but the industry is claiming that the effects from millimeter waves don't go deeper than the skin. Uh, what do you have to say about that? Well, sunlight doesn't go deeper than the skin, right? And we know that that sunlight exposure sets off a whole cascade of, of events in the body, neurohormonal processes, vitamin D production, mood effects. So that argument could be debunked by, I think, by a first year medical student. It doesn't make sense. And we know Dr. Deborah Davis uh, talks about a specific study about sweat ducts and how they act as as helio coil antennas to transmit that energy into the in deeper into the body. So that's another um, aspect that blows that claim out of the water. Just right in our on nervous itself. system is in our skin. We have receptors in the skin. So yeah, it's exactly. So um, how come? Why is there so little awareness then within the medical profession of EMF harm? Well. First of all, the awareness is growing, thankfully, but the, there are several reasons. So doctors aren't, I think, first of all, doctors are subject to the same, doctors are reading the same newspapers and hearing, you know, watching the same TV news shows. And unfortunately, the mainstream media doesn't cover this issue. Um, they don't cover it for many reasons, but, you know, they, I guess they don't want to lose advertising dollars. There are conflicts of interest. They just aren't, they aren't covering it. So doctors are hearing exactly what everyone else is hearing, which is that there's some type of a debate that we haven't figured it out yet. We don't know. Are cell phones safe? Are they not safe? So the same, they're, they're hearing, they're getting all the same information. 
So they're not getting trained properly is the bottom line, right? So they're not, they're not trained. So in medical school, there's no, there's no discussion of electromagnetic fields. There's, you get the same sort of canned explanation of, well, if it's ionizing radiation, it's harmful, non-ionizing radiation, it's not harmful, which we know, which we know is not true based on, on the, you know, 50 years of, of scientific literature that's out there. But but doctors are busy and they take care of patients in their own specialty and they have a lot of they have a lot of uh, you know literature that they have to read in their own specialty so to read about emf science first of all it doesn't make it into the medical journals for that very reason the doctors don't aren't it's just not on their radar it's not something no pun intended but they're they're not they're not thinking about it but the interesting thing that's happening now is that there's this growing interest among doctors, particularly among medical students. And the Institute for Building Biology, where Larry Gust is faculty, actually has not one, but two MD, MPH students. So the medical, it's the joint medical doctor, Masters of Public Health program students. In this, um, this current class, they just graduated an RN MPH, so a nurse MPH with a lot of history, uh, excuse me, with a lot of experience doing, doing behavioral, uh, behavioral health and, and psychiatry. And they have a third nurse. And, and these, are, these are small classes. Like it's not, they are, it's not like a huge class of hundreds of people. So it's very significant. They're having more and more people from the health professions sign up for their courses every year because they're interested in using EMF remediation in research and clinical care. Mm -hmm. Um, so how come, so do you think that doctors are actually seeing cases of what we might term microwave syndrome or effects, symptoms caused by EMF and not recognizing it? Oh, definitely. Like to what, definitely. to what extent, to what scope do you think that's happening? Well, it's, it's really hard for me to say, but the, I think what everyone needs to understand is that, um, there's a lot of talk about. So when we think about uh, electrosensitivity or the terminology that's used, electromagnetic hypersensitivity, which is really a, a scientifically incorrect term because hypersensitivity implies excessive sensitivity, that someone is more sensitive than they should, than they, than they should be, that it's sort of an unreasonable uh, response. But when really what the science shows is that that all humans are affected by microwave exposure. So you'll have uh, certain, certain people are able to feel it. So certain people are electroperceptive. Certain people are um, electrosensitive. So they're, they're what, and what that means in my mind is that they've made the connection between their exposures and their problems. But what you have is everyone else who is affected by microwave radiation but they haven't made that connection. So as far as, as far as microwave syndrome, recognizing microwave syndrome in the clinic or in the hospital, I can tell you just some, some of the really classic presentations that I've seen that really should be a red flag. The, the most important one would be sort of youngish college age students or young adults who are presenting with signs of dementia, with cognitive impairment, short-term memory loss, and it's the, the cognitive problem coupled with what we call orthostatic hypotension, that they get dizzy when they stand up, that their blood pressure is low, and that they're not, they're not sustaining their blood pressure. So generally, when you see those two together, if you've you know, ruled out other causes, this is very common, and, and you see this very commonly in young adults who have had cell phones from a young age. And they, they'll often tell you, oh, well, my dad gave me a cell phone when I was nine, or when I was 10. And so they've had that exposure for a long time. So this is something that, that I see. And a second presentation is particularly behavioral, you know, behavioral changes in, in younger children. Those are, and, and the ones that are you know, extreme mood liability, and that particularly coupled with blood pressure, but really it can present as, as anything. ADHD predominantly, or really just any behavioral changes? Well, it's, 
It's hard. As far as the pediatric stuff, it's a little harder for me to say because I, I take care of the parents. And with children, what, what you end up seeing is that when, because let me just back up for a second, because people may be wondering, well, how can you, how can you diagnose someone or how can you decide that these problems are due to microwave exposure or electromagnetic field exposure? And the way that you figure it out, because this is a clinical diagnosis, there's no test that you can do or imaging study or that makes this diagnosis. It's that when, when the electromagnetic field exposure for that particular patient is lowered as much as possible and in some cases it's not completely possible to do like if if their home is under you know right next to a huge power line the magnetic there's nothing you can do about it it's the magnetic field so certain people you really it's very hard to fix the problem but for everyone else um let's say person comes in a, a college student comes in and has very low blood pressure is dizzy when they stand up um, can't get the blood pressure up they're not dehydrated and they have they have signs of early dementia and short-term memory loss that can be really impressive. So the treat, the intervention would be having someone like Larry or another building biologist go into the home and evaluate the home for really the four key electromagnetic fields that we know are harmful to health. And when they lower their exposures as much as possible, if you see a big change in symptoms, then you have your diagnosis. So this is a part of also why, you know, why doctors are, are not really able to make this kind of a diagnosis. It's difficult because they can't really do it alone. They need to work with a building biologist or an engineer or just someone who has the training and who has the, the equipment to be able to do the measuring in the home. Mm -hmm. Okay. So other aspects of 5G, one of the talked about or publicized aspects of it is this whole autonomous vehicle thing. Dr. Timothy Sheckley in the summit talks about this and he said, even if we want autonomous vehicles, even for those people that want them, wireless and 5G is not needed. Um, and, and so I just wanted to ask you, do you have a perspective on um, the internet of things, autonomous vehicles or any other aspects of, of, um, of the, the 5G you know, rollout, planned rollout? Yeah, so... One of the, the biggest problems that we have now is that our, our existing scientific literature, like I said, it's just been sitting and collecting dust for decades. And we have this disconnect between what is happening in industry and what the science says about electromagnetic fields on, on human physiology. And because of this regulatory vacuum, that there aren't really any meaningful health protective guidelines in effect to guide industry, we've had the development of just all sorts of products that, that emit various EMFs that we know are harmful to humans or that undermine our, our basic physiology. So cars are a really good example of a technology that we need to improve and that we could improve really, you know, pretty simply by, by just looking at what are the EMFs in the average car, how are they problematic, and then how can we re-engineer the car to lower the exposures? So to give you an example, um, what's a good example? I mean, most new cars nowadays have, first of all, they have, they have Bluetooth in them. So you're going to go drive the car. So you get in the car, you get in the car with your phone. Your phone is emitting microwaves. Um, the Bluetooth is emitting microwaves, so different frequencies. The car is made out of metal. So we know that microwaves, when they hit metal, get, it gets bounced back. And it ampli you have an even higher power density. If you're in there with a meter measuring, you'll see the level of radiation go, go sky high. So that's just microwave exposure. I think some other cars may have Wi-Fi and other sources of microwave. I don't have a brand new car, so I'm not sure about that. So that's just microwaves, okay? Cars have magnetic fields, and depending on the car and how it's designed, the magnetic fields can be, can be really, really high. And we know that magnetic fields, for instance, we have good literature showing that magnetic fields correlate with obesity, particularly when it's, it's uh, prenatal 
magnetic field exposure that the, the, the babies have an increased chance of being obese. So, and all sorts of other literature on magnetic fields. So cars have, emit microwaves. Cars emit very heavy magnetic fields. And so in the case of these newer cars, electric cars, the magnetic fields are through the roof. And so, and usually it's in the back seat of the car. So who rides in the back seat? The kids are riding in the back seat. So the kids are getting these, you know, these huge magnetic fields. And, and then you have, you have electric fields and you have, you have, in, and you can also have a, what we call dirty electricity, uh, micro surge electrical pollution. So there, are, you know, all th these fields. It, it, and so the question is, well, could we make a healthier car? Of course we could make a healthier car. It's just, so we need to like look at the science and say, well, the science says this. We need to read the science and say, okay, we need to use our science to make, to make healthier cars. And how could this change public health? Well, I mean, it could, it could make a huge impact on public health because if someone were driving a healthier car, you would lower their exposures to, to multiple fields. And for instance, look at people who spend their entire day in cars, uh, taxi drivers. We have, um, I don't know when in New York, because I used to live in New York City, the, I remember when they introduced this thing called taxi TV, where it's a, it's a big screen that so the passenger, when you're sitting in the back seat of the car, they, you know, you can watch ads. And I guess, I guess the cab company makes money off of that. But so there's a screen there, and obviously there's wiring in the seat. So well, what, what's going on with the driver who's sitting, who's got the screen on his back? What are the fields in these cars? And we also know that there's been, you know, there's been this epidemic of suicide among taxi drivers in New York. And I'm not saying that I have the answer, but I'm, I'm saying that we, we're not even asking the questions. We need to be asking these questions. If we have an epidemic of suicide, how do we negotiate the fact that the science links depression, depression and, and mood problems with EMFs? We have an epidemic of diabetes. How do we, we need to be, we need to be asking these questions. So technology, we need to ask the questions. Um, another, I mean, another really good example is, uh, you know, our, our medical devices. For instance, this was news to me. I, I found out recently that that now that that they're using apps for type one diabetics for continuous glucose monitoring for cell phones, which sounds like a really good idea, uh, a really good idea. But so if we know that microwave radiation causes oxidative stress, and we know that, and we know that some of the most dreaded complications of type one diabetes, like retinopathy, are linked intimately with oxidative stress. Well, what is this doing when, you know, if someone is staring at the phone with type one diabetes and, and causing oxidative stress to their eyes? We, we have to be thinking about these things because we simply can't afford, we, we, we can't afford to make people sicker than they are. And they're already sicker than they should be. You mentioned cars um, should be being made safer, and you gave examples of, of why and how. What would, in that example, like, let's just look at cars, how they're being manufactured. What would be required in order for manufacturers to you know, stop trying to compete with each other to have the latest wireless gadgetry in sort of this like competitive arms race based upon convenience, to shift from that paradigm to we need to actually make cars safe based upon the science and like what would be required is it just an awareness thing is it a numbers thing is it enough people speaking up how do you see that happening well the public has to be educated because right now people don't people don't know because if so if the mainstream media doesn't cover this issue the the people that are talking about it sound like they're crazy because it's like oh well i read in the new york times that there's no evidence to show that that cell phones are harmful. I mean, so I think that we have a real problem. So the public needs to be educated and the public needs to be educated from a, uh, what's the word, from, it needs to come from a place. I think it really needs to come from either the state level or the federal level. It needs to come from our institutions of public health 
or the CDC. I'm not sure who, you know, who would get into that, but I think starting at the state level is a good idea because the states are the ones getting stuck with the Medicaid bill when, when, you know, when people show up with end-stage kidney disease in the hospital and need ur urgent hemodialysis. I mean, the and people that don't qualify for emergency Medicaid or, you know, the, ultimately the states have to pay for Medicaid. And as people get sicker, you're, you're seeing more and more young people getting funneled into Medicaid because they're having strokes, they're having heart attacks, they're having heart failure, they're having these catastrophic health outcomes, they're having cancer and they're not able to work, they lose their benefits and, and, and this is just, this is what's happening. So I believe that looking at how can, how can we educate people at the state level, um, departments of public health, I think that that's a good place to start. But people, first they have to understand what, uh, what are the dangers of, what are the health effects of microwave radiation? And once that's done then, and once they understand it and, the, and that it comes from a credible source, then they can at least make informed decisions. So that could, an informed decision could be, well, I would like to have a, a healthier car, that a, like a low EMF car, or it could be, well, I would like to have my internet at home come from a, you know, from a wired, uh, a wired modem and not a Wi-Fi router. I don't want to have Wi-Fi in my home, or I want to have a landline. It could be a whole bunch of different decisions, but it all starts with with uh, with the public being educated and being aware that there's actually a problem. Because right now there there is there's not a lot of awareness because of all the confusion that's been that's been really deliberately created in you know in by the wireless industry in the press. That's mm -hmm. that's what we're living with now. Yeah. The, the awareness seems to be mostly limited to online, right? And so it's not coming through traditional channels. It's not coming through media or our academic institutions or, or, or government, and, and especially our, you know, the higher levels of government, the federal government, for example. So you mentioned... Um, you oh, mentioned can I just say one thing, though? Please. Because there is one newspaper that does actually cover that does actually cover this issue and they cover it very well mm -hmm. and it's called the epoch times and i had never heard of this newspaper in my life until a reporter contacted me to do an, an interview and i've actually subscribed to it they have a really good um, mind and body section it's a very good it's a very good newspaper so there mm -hmm. are this there is one newspaper that covers it and maybe there are a few more but and there are actually to you know to to that end there are an increasing number of mainstream papers that are at least questioning, is 5G safe? You know, like the yeah. London Telegraph, the Chicago Tribune, the Wired Magazine, um, you know, even engineering journals, even the IEEE mm -hmm. is publishing some studies on 5G, on millimeter wave frequencies showing their home. So this conversation is happening. It's just that we need, like if you're, if, okay, so if, if someone in a, in a public health stakeholder position is watching this right now, what are the key messages that they need to be aware of? Whether it's it's people, you know, writing them, uh, their elected officials and stakeholders, or whether it's just on this call right now. What would you say to to people in that position? To people working in public health or legislators. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I'll say it again. There's no point in funding scientific research if we're going to ignore it. So first of all, to start with. We need to really look at the science and we need to look at the independent science, not the science that's been funded by the wireless industry, because we know that there's very, there's very clear bias there, that the outcome of medical studies all is, is linked to funding sources that, that we've known for decades. So that really the, there are potential solutions to our greatest health challenges. And those potential solutions lie in that science on electromagnetic fields and health. And really, when you microwave a population over time, they get sick. When you when you lower when you when you stop microwaving them or lower the exposures, many symptoms get better. So what this would translate into is improve improved population health. I can't guarantee it, but this is what this is what the science says. And you can't you can't prove it any better than we've already proven it. Like we're not going to be able to test these things on people, as I've already mentioned. So we have to work with the existing science that we have, and we have a lot of it. So 
as far as you know, practical solutions and what what really needs to be done because really there is this economic imperative we have to take action we, we really can't keep dragging our feet on this because we can't afford more sick people so to start with we we need we need a fiber optic network this is you know we need we need optical fiber to homes and offices and there are so many reasons why this is this is much better than 5G. Uh, so many reasons, and I'm sure you have other people talking about this, but it's- D Dr. It's, Timothy Sheckley actually lays out examples of how to do that, how a city takes back control of its infrastructure and wires, and he gives specific examples of cities that have already done that. Wonderful. So yeah, so there are so many reasons why any legislator should be looking to fiber as, you know, just as a much smarter choice because of speed and cybersecurity and safety and poles can't collapse in a storm and just so many reasons aside from the health reasons. But to start with really, we, so we absolutely need, we need fiber optic. That's sort of the base of all of this. We need to start with looking at sensitive populations. We need to look at our children and really what, so schools, need to be wired there's there's no reason to be using wi-fi in schools and now that we know that wireless radiation is is clearly associated with cancer dna damage cardiomyopathy we know this it is really there are some ser there are serious legal issues with continuing to require this mandatory irradiation of children in schools so schools have to be wired up um, you know, device use has to be really, they really have to rethink device use in children for, for many reasons. But once again, it, I, I bring this back to economics because, because that's, I think that's ultimately what makes people listen because that, what we're that's the language, right, excuse me, sorry to interrupt. But that's the language, but please go ahead. Yeah, so, so if you think about how, once again, we're, the science is disconnected from our, from our policies and our practices. Right now in schools, we have, we, have a di well, we have a diabetes epidemic in the United States. Everyone knows that. And so I can tell you in, you know, in schools, we, kids are using laptops, they're using these Chromebooks, and they're being exposed to, to microwave radiation that we have good science showing, showing associations with diabetes. So we also have good science showing associations with oxidative stress. And hopefully this isn't too technical for your audience, but the children are taking these devices and they're putting them right over their, their bellies, okay? So the device, when it's set for use on Wi-Fi, is emitting microwaves, right? So you're getting microwave emissions right over the liver and right over the pancreas. So why is that relevant? Because when you cause oxidative stress to the liver and the pancreas, we know how the, the, you know, the mechanisms of diabetes and the mechanisms of what we call NASH, which is, which is a, a, comes from fatty liver, which essentially it, it, it le is one of the, the top indications for liver transplant. It leads to cirrhosis. And we know that also oxidative stress is a mechanism in the development of NASH cirrhosis. So these are things, and then over the pancreas is, you know, the pancreas has very poor defenses against oxidative stress. So this is what we're doing to our children. And then we're, you know, we don't understand, well, why do we have these diabetes epidemics? Why, why are our rates of NASH cirrhosis going through, the, going through the roof? Can I prove this? No, I can't prove it. But these are, we have our basic science, and my battery is going low here. We have our basic science, and we have to, we have to use that basic science that our, you know, our grandparents' tax dollars paid for, and we have to actually use it. We can't. We could put it to really good use, but it's being it's just being disregarded right now. Um, so another issue that relates to schools, because we're we're talking about children now, is that cell antennas should not be pointing at schools. Cell towers should not be on school property. They shouldn't be near school property, and schools should be you know, should be low EMF environments because of what, what the science tells us. So those are, you know, those are places to start. Another, another really important, um, important intervention would be, 
uh, mandatory labeling of devices that emit microwave radiation. Mm -hmm. So you want to go buy an Xbox or a PlayStation or, or a cell phone. These, these devices need to be labeled. People don't, a lot of people don't even realize that their video games are, are microwave, microwave transmitters. They're baby monitors, cordless phones. So they have to be labeled. And there really should be a process of informed consent where if you're going to go buy it, you should be reading some type of a document that says microwave radiation has been shown to cause blah, 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 blah. I won't go down the list, but you know, that should be the process of informed consent. So at least consumers are able to make educated decisions because we know that not everyone's going to care. Some people are just not going to care and they're going to, you know, they're going to buy this stuff anyway. And that's fine. That's fine. But the, the, some people do care. A lot of people may care, especially parents are going to care. Pregnant women, I guarantee you, are going to care. But but now they, they don't even know. Like people just don't know. So we need to to enact policies that make it, you know, make it easier for people to make healthy decisions and make it harder for them to make the unhealthy decisions. So it's um you know, it's, I think those are just some places to start, but obviously there, there should be, we shouldn't be rolling out 5G. We shouldn't be rolling out microwaves from space. These are, this is a highly unethical. And if you can't expose people to this in a lab, companies should not be allowed to expose people. This is experimenting on humans. Mm -hmm. Really quickly, before we close this, I um, wanted to mention uh, in, in the summit, Richard Lear talks about a new model that actually extends on the causation model that Dr. Uh, Martin Paul is bringing forward involving um, calcium, voltage-gated calcium channels, peroxynitrite. Uh, Richard Lear looks at the meta-science and he, he looks at and, and all the studies and kind of com uh, compiles the studies, oxidative stress, nitrative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, DNA damage, and, uh, and uh, peroxynitrite and so forth. Um, and, and he um, is, is helping, you know, to kind of create a new framework of understanding of, of how, what are the causes of these, you know, these recent epidemics in uh, chronic germless diseases. And I know your work touches, your research touches on that too. Is there anything that you want to add in, in, in terms of, you know, reevaluating, look at, looking at some of these epidemics that are kind of increasing, you know, autism and, and Alzheimer's and other neuropsychiatric conditions and, and, you know, all, all these kinds of things. What level of causation do you think that, that EMF exposures actually has here in this what's going on in our current health um, scenario? Well, it's hard to put a number on that or give an estimate, but the, you know, the way to research this would be to do what we call remediation research, which is essentially applying the principles of building biology to lowering a person's home environment, lowering all the EMFs that you can in the home, in the office, and then, and then observing the person. So, and you would do this in specific groups of patients with, a, with specific conditions. So based on my clinical experience, and if you speak with other doctors who work with building biologists and who do you know, incorporate EMF remediation as a, or you call it environmental modification into their practice, I mean, it's pretty incredible the responses that you can see when people are able to truly modify their exposures. So, so we can study, you know, we, we should be studying this in populations of people and, and there are, you know, there are researchers who are interested in doing this. And so that would be the only way to truly answer this question. But the problem is that you can modify someone's exposure at home, but it's our, our occupational exposures are very problematic. If you look at the way, and this again has to do with this, this disconnect between what does the, the science say and what you know are this this absence of regulation as far as you know it's human EMF exposure. So when someone goes to work, if you just look at the way wireless devices are used in, you know, in retail, 
in, you know, you go to Starbucks and see what people are wearing on their heads and their bodies. You look at police officers, you know, you know, they're wearing these, these wireless body cameras. They're wearing a walkie talkie. They're sitting in a squad car with a laptop. I'm assuming Wi-Fi. I'm not sure. So people are getting these massive microwave exposures on the job. Those are not modifiable. And from the, at least not, not until some type of, there's recognition of this in the occupational health community. Um, and also understanding that lowering exposures should, you know, should increase worker productivity. And it should also, for companies that are that self-insure, it should lower their healthcare costs. But getting back to the example of police officers, so, I mean, they have to operate firearms and they're in situations where their lives could be potentially endangered. So we know that, that these, these heavy microwave exposures from different frequency devices, the walkie-talkie, the, the uh, body camera, the, we know that these exposures cause leakage of the blood-brain barrier and they cause problems with cognitive function, with response times. This is what the science says. So we need to be connecting the dots and looking at really looking at our occupational exposures as well. So for sure, it's, I believe that EMF exposure is, you know, this is the cutting edge public health intervention that needs to happen yeah. in the coming years. This is what we need to do. Yeah, we need to protect our police officers and all occupations and our children from, yes. you know, microwave radiation in the classroom. And it's and um, like we really need to protect our police officers here. Yeah. You know, and uh, and and everyone and everyone else. And but it, yeah. also the the fire departments are many of them involved in saying no to having you know wireless uh, you know cell towers and 5g transmitters on their on their property they have um just doing an internet search would reveal um, many developments on that they need to prevent their exposures as well so dr sharon goldberg thank you so much for your time today and just thank this you. conversation has been so rich and detailed and fascinating about the science around microwave radiation and, and millimeter wave radiation i just want to um encourage if you're watching this uh, please share this link. This the, the link to this to this talk where everyone can watch it and stream it because this is how we reach towards this critical mass threshold. This is how we reach towards what Dr. Goldberg was talking about, having the awareness so that different decisions are made in our society. Different decisions are made by car manufacturers where we hold you know, our elected officials, um, we inform them and hold them accountable to do the right thing. So please share this talk. Um, Dr. Goldberg, um, thank you. We look forward to hear more from you and I'm, I'm so grateful for your, your time uh, in, in, in spending with us today. You're welcome and thank you, Josh, for all the work that you've done. And I love Take Back Your Power. It was a really good film, very eye-opening for me. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye.